Welcome to Westminster and to this service of worship. It's good to have each one of you here as we gather in this place to worship God. I uh, do want to encourage you to fill out the Connect card that should have been in your bulletin. Chance to let us know you're here. Also a chance to share your prayer concerns. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you're with us and hope you also sign in and share your prayer concerns as well. A couple things to share this morning. I first want to welcome Katie Todd. Uh, she's going to help lead worship today. Katie is a Presbyterian pastor and our campus ministry with you, Kirk, serving several campuses here. Uh, she and her children are worshiping with us regularly, usually sitting back over on that side. So uh, you, you'll see her back there near a rocking chair. Uh, but we're glad Katie is here and helping us to lead worship. Um, it's hard to believe it's March now, and that partly means summer is near, and that means there are lots of opportunities at Westminster during the summertime. So we've got some trips, we've got retreats, we've got conferences, 
Uh, we've got Vacation Bible School. We've got Rock School. A lot of those deadlines for signing up are coming soon, so we just encourage you to pay attention to that and look on the church website if you're interested in participating in any of those things. Um, we also have our mission auction coming up. Uh, that's on April 13th. That is a part of a larger Lenten challenge where we are seeking to raise $40,000 that will be used both to lift up families, try to help families get into and stay in affordable housing, and I'll support these mission trips that we do for our youth and also for our adults. And we have something new this year, which is a raffle for tickets to a trip to Scotland, a place that's been important in Presbyterian history. You may have seen some of that uh, out there. And so Scott Neely, our Director of Outreach and uh, Connections, and Scott Stevenson, our two Scots, have prepared a brief podcast uh, to give you a little more details. So we're going to invite you to listen to this podcast as we begin. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Scott Neely, and I'm here with my partner, Scott Stevens, to really dive in on this terrific offer and a real chance of a lifetime to see the majestic country of Scotland by rail. Welcome to Scott and Scott on Scotland. Oh, I am so excited about this one, Scott. Me too. You know, for a mere $100, you're eligible for this exclusive drawing and a shot at this exciting train trip throughout Scotland. Yeah, let's not forget that this is all for a great cause too. A fundraiser on Saturday, April 13th for the work that we do. Mm. I am just so excited. I can barely sit in the I seat. know, and I'm guessing that it's at that fundraiser that we'll draw for the winner of this fantastic eight day and seven night intimate rail tour of some of Scotland's greatest points of interest. Oh yes, and, and absolutely. And here's the kicker, Scott. We actually have the tour guide for that excursion waiting to join us on Zoom to tell us a little more about the trip. Yes, yes. How about yes. that? Let's, let's bring him on. All right, well, let's see here. Let's let's welcome Angus Dufer McTavish. Did I, did I say that right? Oh, you did. Dufer is McTavish, Mac being son of Tavish. <laughs> Hello, cheers, and thanks for having me. Well, welcome, Angus. Welcome. Yes, thank you. So uh, you're, you're coming to Scotland, are you? Uh, I can a bit about the place, and I'm happy to share with you some secrets uh, tips and anything you like about the great land of Robert the Bruce and William Wallace and Shrek. Well, uh, well, Angus, let's let's maybe we start with where this with the trip starts in, in Edinburgh, I believe. Oh, in Edinburgh, I, right? Ah, yes, the crown jewel of Scotland, Athens of the North. Oh, well, well, tell us, what's there to do? Well, let's see. To start with, you've got the spectacular Edinburgh Castle which dates all the way back to the 11th century. And that, my friend, is a lot older than anything you Yankee Doodle Dandies can boast about. <laughs> you did say this was a Kirk fundraiser, right? Eh? Oh, uh, yes, at, at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Ah, yes, the Frozen Chosen. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I suppose I'm... I may, may, I, maybe I am the Frozen I Chosen. Hmm. Hmm. Away we go by train up north to, to the Highlands. How about that? Um, what, what can we expect there? Oh, there the most spectacular views in the world. Could, could we move into things to, to do there? Actually? Yeah. Well, there's the local Highland Games there, of course. The Caber Toss and the Highland Fling Competition. And, of course, the pipes. Oh, bag, bagpipes? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so they're a bit screechy for me. I prefer Scottish tenor Kenneth McKellar. Roaming in the gloaming on the bonny banks of Clyde. Roaming in the gloaming with a lassie by my side. Oh, and that's, uh, that was, Scott, that was lovely, wasn't yeah, it? Indeed, that was, oh, it was amazing. Aye, that uh, brought a wee tear to my ear. Well, on, on that note, I, I'm kind of thinking we're out of time now. Yeah, I think it is time to wrap it up. Scott. Yeah, let's do that. Well, I, Angus, I want to thank you for being part of this podcast. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's it for Scott. And Scott. On, on Scotland. Scotland. <laughs> Scott and Scott for their uh, creativity, uh, helping us know about that opportunity. As we turn now to this time of worship, we are remembering this morning the story of Jesus entering the temple. 
uh, Jesus enters the temples and sees that his father's house has been turned into a marketplace, and so he drives out the money changers and that sets the animals free. He talks about a time when the temple will be turned uh, torn down and we'll, when the new temple will be raised up. And so this morning we're thinking about what are those things that might need to be torn down, things that need to be stopped, and what are the things that, that God is raising up, and how can we as the body of Christ be raised up as a, as a new temple, a holy dwelling place for God in the world. So let us stand and sing our opening response. <laughs> on now? Oh, yes. no, I won't yell. All right. Let us join together in our prayer this morning. God of restoration and rebuilding, we are here today seeking resurrection and renewal for our tired and worn out bodies and the body of this community. In this moment of quiet, we lift up to you those things we'd like to give up for good, and those places where we need something new to be raised up. Amen. Hear these words of assurance for us from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. My friends, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven and raised to new life. Thanks be to God. And in that joyous news, let us share the peace of Christ with each other, saying the peace of Christ be with you and responding and also with you. I invite you to stand now as you are able or don't and share the peace of Christ with those around you. Peace be with you.
Let's all stand and sing our song. seated and I invite the children to join me on the chancel steps What's up, turkey trot? That doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> Something my grandmother used to say, I don't know. Um, we'll, just, we'll just leave it at that. Um, remember, we are asking for the next couple of weeks, what's up? And we're looking for little acts of kindness that we can do for each other. Have you seen somebody be kind this week? What did they do? They helped somebody when they fell. Anybody else see somebody do something kind this week? Well, sometimes if you know you're, oh, you've got something? No? Just let us, okay. So, speaking of acts of kindness, were you all here on um, Ash Wednesday when we gave these cups out? If you didn't get one, I want you to get one today because we're collecting change. It tells you what we're doing in here, so I'm not going to give you all the details. But if you didn't get one and would like one, just come up when we're done, okay? We're going to um, 
go on with our story that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks and see what Carl and Russell are up to. And if you want to see the pictures, they're, they're showing up on the screen. On the way to the falls, Russell found weird tracks in the mud. They belonged to a bird, a strange, huge, colorful bird. Russell named the bird Kevin. It was bad enough that Carl had to put up with the junior wilderness explorer. That's Russell. He didn't need a huge bird to scram, Carl said. Kevin followed them anyway. Kevin wasn't the only odd creature they met. Next, Carl and Russell found a dog. Hi there, said the dog. My name is Doug. Carl and Russell were shocked. The dog could talk. Doug was on a mission to bring the bird to his master. But Carl promised Russell that he would protect Kevin. And as it turned out, Kevin was a mother. She had baby birds waiting for her at home. Nothing was going the way Carl had planned. He now had a floating house, a talking dog, a junior wilderness explorer, and a huge bird. Whatever happened to being alone with just his house and his memories of Ellie? He really wasn't alone, was he? He'd been missing his wife, Ellie, who was no longer with him, but he definitely was not alone. But if, if I'm being honest, he probably was a little perturbed. You know what that means to be perturbed? A little angry, a little just grumpy that all of those people were crashing in on his, his trip to Paradise Falls. Um... Any of you get grumpy sometimes? No one? Oh, good. Just one of you. Yes. Oh, two, three, four, five. Okay. Everybody gets grumpy sometimes. Everybody gets grumpy sometimes. And you know what? Even Jesus got grumpy. And this week, the scripture story is about Jesus. And he was, he was a little angry, but it was for a good reason. Um, the temple, which was the house of worship, was being misused and the poorest of people were being treated terribly unfairly. So that still happens at this day and time, right? We see people that aren't being treated the way that they should be treated. And there's nothing wrong with you standing up like Jesus did for his father's house for them. So if you see somebody who is um, not being treated well... You know what you can do? Who can you tell? An adult you trust. Absolutely. That could be a teacher. That could be a pastor. That could be a parent. It could be, it, yeah, who else can you tell? A babysitter. What a good person to select. Yeah. Somebody that's taking care of you might take care of someone else as well, right? So let's think about being up to something good this week, okay? Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, thank you for putting on our hearts the, the joy of doing something good. We pray that you're with us in all that we do. Amen. Let's sing our song as we're going back to our seats. Does anybody want one of these? I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. 
He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's lift to God in prayer. God, we pray that in these words of Scripture and in the words of the sermon, you would allow us to hear your word for us this day, that you would quiet any voice within us but your own. And we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Ecclesiastes says there's a time to tear down and a time to build up. And I think that's what's happening in this Scripture passage today. Jesus comes to do both. Uh, Jesus sees the people selling cattle and sheep and dove in the temple. He sees the money changers and he overturns their tables. He drives people out. He says, stop making my father's house a marketplace. There's some things that we need to stop that need to be torn down. And that may be in our life. It may be in our church. It may be in our society. But Jesus also talks about raising up a new temple. And so I want to listen to the story and think about what things God might be calling us to tear down, what things might God might be calling us to stop, and what things need to be built up, uh, what things is God raising up among us. Well, the story starts with the tearing down, with something that needs to stop. Uh, Dale Brenner says that Jesus' anger here is provoked not by social injustice, people taking advantage of other people, but by spiritual obtuseness. Uh, certainly God is concerned about social injustice, but, but that doesn't seem to be the main, main focus here. The focus is a kind of spiritual blindness. Uh, nothing wrong with a marketplace. Nothing wrong with selling animals. The, the pilgrims who are coming to Jerusalem need a place to buy animals. Uh, they need a place to exchange their money so they can pay the temple tax. Uh, the problem is that, that these things have come into the temple. Uh, the temple is not a marketplace, the temple is not a shopping mall, the temple is not a bank, the temple is a place of worship. The temple is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. Uh, the temple is a place where people come and experience the presence of the living God. And the folks who've turned it into a marketplace are just oblivious to that. Uh, I think there's a warning here that, that it's easy sometimes to, to let our faith get off track. Uh, or to let somebody else hijack our faith. Sometimes it's easier to focus more on our agenda than God's agenda. Sometimes it's easy to miss God's presence, miss what God is doing and saying in the midst of our worship. Uh, I have to confess, I, I was a little bit nervous about that opening video today, uh, particularly when I was preaching on this passage. I, I wonder whether promoting raffle tickets was turning God's house into a marketplace. <laughs> And I think there is just a fine line there. Um, I decided that since we're trying to, to, to raise money for a good cause, that it would be okay. But, but I do think we just always have to be careful. I, I think it's easy to begin to, to replace God's agenda with our agenda, to, to make our faith, to make our worship, to make our church more about our desires, our agenda, less about God's desires, God's agenda, what God is calling us to do. Um, and so I think we always have to, to be careful about turning God's church into a marketplace, a place where we come to get what we want. Uh, I think today there's also maybe a temptation not to turn the church 
into a marketplace, but to turn it into a political rally. I know that politics are important. I know that politics impact people's lives. Uh, we've seen that this week with the ruling on in vitro fertilization. Uh, but I also, and, and I know that, that our faith needs to inform our politics, that, that our, our, our politics need to be informed by the values that, that grow out of our faith. But I sometimes just worry that, that our politics today have almost become a new kind of religion. I worry that they've become so polarized that they're more about a kind of tribal warfare than they are about trying to come to, to a common uh, good, to, to solve our problems. Uh, God's house is not a marketplace. God's house is not a political rally. And when it starts to turn into that, I think Jesus says, stop. Uh, the story then shifts to this confrontation between Jesus and religious leaders. And, and the religious leaders are not happy with what Jesus has done. And so they come to Jesus and they ask, what, what sign can you give us for, for having done this? What, what, what proof can you show us? that you've got authority to take this kind of radical action in God's house. And Jesus simply says, tear down this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And the religious leaders don't know what he's talking about. Uh, they, they say the temple's been under construction 46 years. How can you raise it up in three days? But, but John the Gospel writer says Jesus is not talking about the physical structure of the temple. He's talking about his body. And that will be the only sign that Jesus gives, this, this symbol of his body being raised in three days. Uh, Jesus is crucified, dead, and buried on the third day. He raises again. And somehow in being raised from the dead, Jesus says he's going to raise up a new temple. Jesus opens up this new way of, of connecting with God, of, of experiencing God's presence, of, of receiving God's forgiveness. People are not going to have to come to the old temple anymore uh, to offer a sacrifice. Uh, somehow Jesus is this new way of connecting with God, this, this dwelling place of God's presence. And I think part of what that means is, is that we as a church are also called to, to be raised up as this kind of temple, a, a kind of dwelling place for God's presence. That we in the church are called to be a place where people find God's presence, where they experience God's grace, where they're transformed by God's love. Uh, in the Gospels, Simon recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the one who will bring about God's kingdom on earth. And then Jesus says that you're going to have a new name, that, that your name will now be Peter, the rock. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. It doesn't mean that Peter is perfect, doesn't mean the church is perfect, uh, we get off track sometimes, but, but it does mean that the church can be, the church is called to be, this kind of new temple, this place where we discover the presence of God. And I do think as, as we think about the church as a new temple, we need to make sure that we don't think that simply means the church replaces uh, the Jewish faith, or the church replaces what God is doing through the people of Israel. Apostle Paul actually wrestles with that question, and he says that, that as God does this new thing in the church, does that mean that God has rejected the people of Israel, the chosen people? And Paul's answer is by no means. He says because God's gift and God's call is irrevocable. What it means is that God is simply expanding this work that he does, that, that what God begins through the people of Israel and continues there also now happens in the church, that God is building this new temple, a house of prayer for all people. So Jesus does not just tear things down, Jesus also raises things up. And I think that's an ongoing process. And so I think the question for us is, is always, what is Jesus calling us to stop? What needs to be torn down? And what is, what is Jesus calling us to build up? What is God raising up? We had a gathering not long ago of our College of Elders, and then we followed that with a session retreat, and, and we talked about these questions. What, where's God leading us as a church? What, what does God want us to stop doing? What does he want us to tear down? And what, what does God want us to focus on? 
Uh, and two things came up at both of those conversations. Uh, at, at both of those conversations, there was a lot of talk about this kind of polarization in our society that, that seemed to just be dividing us. Uh, there was conversation about ways in which this, this polarization tends to take complicated problems that we face and reduce it to a kind of either-or choice. Uh, to either there's one side or there's another side or there's nothing beyond that. And then to try to make us choose sides. You have to be on one side or the other. And that ends up often distorting the truth. It ends up kind of wanting you to demonize people who might disagree with you. Uh, and it turns into that kind of tribalism that just divides us and it doesn't solve any of our problems. I think if Jesus sees, when Jesus sees what's happening in our politics and sometimes even our church, Jesus would simply say, stop. Stop dividing people into these either or categories. Stop using anger and fear to try to be tools for your agenda. Stop only listening to people who agree with you. I think Jesus calls the church to be a different place. A place where we come together in spite of our differences. A place where we listen to each other and learn from each other. Even when we disagree on important issues. I think the church is a place where we stick together. Because we know that we are united by our faith in Christ. So that was one thing that came up was this polarization, how we as a church might be called to address it. And then there was also talk about engagement and, and how we build up community, how we connect with each other, how we connect with others. And so this real sense that, that we as a church need to keep thinking about how do we engage and build community? How do we build these relationships? How do we reach out to members who've become inactive? It's, it's easy to drift away. And how do we make sure people know they're missed? And and we, we want them to be a part of our community. We talked about reaching out to folks beyond our walls. How, how do we reach folks who, who, uh, who may be looking for a place to engage? Uh, I know I'm biased on this, but I think just Westminster has so much to offer folks. We can be a blessing to so many people. We, we want to grow not because we want to move our numbers up, but simply because we want to serve more people to be that blessing. We also talked some about it in, in, in our context how can we reach folks who are not even interested in church, who may never come in a church door? How can we be church for them? Because they still need support in difficult times. They still need some place where they can connect with a sense of community, some place where they can connect with God, some place they find meaning and purpose. I think this is an ongoing process, so we'll keep listening, but, but those are two places that we're feeling called to, uh, to build up and to tear down, to, to address that polarization, and also to engage, to, to build up community. There's a time to tear down, and there's a time to build up, and Jesus comes to do both. Jesus stops some things and tears down some things, and Jesus builds up other things. And so we try to listen to him. And then we try to do both too. Let's look to God in prayer. God, we are grateful for your presence. And we pray that you would never allow us to take that presence for granted. We pray that you would show us the things we need to stop. The things we need to stop in our life. Things we need to stop in our church. Things we need to stop in our society. And we pray that you would show us what you are building up, what you are raising up, so that we might join you in that work. And we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. We have heard Christ's words about how we use our resources and what to build up. So now we have the opportunity to build up one another and our greater community through the giving of ourselves and our offerings to God. <sighs> Thank you. 
I've seen love come and I've seen love walk away. So many questions, will anybody stay? It's been a hard year, so many nights and tears, all of the darkness trying to fight my fears. Alone, so long, alone. I don't know what I'd be if I didn't know you would probably fall off the started breathing the weight is lifted here with you it's easy my head is finally to come to the table this morning I do want to share a couple of prayer celebrations a couple of prayer concerns um, some of you heard that Ned Pierce longtime member of this church and of this community passed away unexpectedly on Friday so want to keep their family uh, keep Ned's family in our prayers his wife Margaret his children Brian and Anna uh, their spouses and their six grandchildren that service is going to be here in the church at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, in our sanctuary Lord in your mercy yeah. our prayers uh, we've been playing for, praying for Britton Black um, after his work accident. Uh, Keith and uh, April are here this morning. I think there's some celebrations there 
in success of surgery, there are also still some concerns as uh, more surgeries remain. So we'll continue to lift Britain up in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I heard this morning that Laura uh, Krasicki's father uh, has cancer and is not doing well, and so we want to lift him up in our prayers as well. Lord, in your mercy. Are there other prayer celebrations, other prayer concerns to share before we come to communion? Marianne? Mary Ellen's cousin Aubrey, Abra, who was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, and husband also had a diagnosis um, of MS. So I want to remember that couple in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Other prayer concerns for celebration. If not, we'll come then to a time of prayer and a time for the sacraments. Our friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Jesus says that people will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit together at table in his kingdom. Jesus says, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so we are all welcome in this place, this place of prayer and praise. We are all welcome at this table. Uh, Jesus is the host, and Jesus invites all who seek him to come and to share in this feast that he has prepared for us. Let us pray. Gracious God, in your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and serve you, to bless others as you have blessed us. And yet we turn away. We trust in ourselves rather than you, we allow fear and jealousy and pride to rule over us, bringing division and death into your good creation. But you do not abandon us. You are at work in the world and in our lives, calling us back into relationships with you and with each other. Your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And, your, and you pour out your spirit upon us, equipping us to serve your purposes in this world. As we share this bread and cup, make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out in, to be the body of Christ in the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all of the saints in the joy of your eternal kingdom. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art Lord in, in heaven, heaven, Hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name, thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after he'd blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after blessing it, he poured it out, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, shed in my blood, given for you. Take and drink, as often as you do, remember me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I just... I just stand for the benediction. And now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help those who are suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now in the grace of God our Father, the love of His Son Jesus Christ, and the power of God's Spirit be with you now and always.